Hello, today we're going to talk about coronary anomalies. Before we get started, I want to give you three learning objectives or things that you should be able to do at the end of this presentation. One, you should be able to identify the normal coronary arteries. Two, I'd like for you to be able to list three categories of coronary anomalies. And finally, list three hemodynamically significant types of coronary anomaly. Let's start with the normal coronary anatomy to begin with. So on the left side, there's the left main coronary artery, which in the majority of people bifurcates into the left anterior descending, which we commonly refer to as the LED, and the left circumflex. I want you to remember where these run anatomically. So the LED runs in the anterior interventricular groove, and the circumflex runs in the left atrioventricular groove. Now, in about a third of patients, it's actually a trifurcation rather than a bifurcation, and that third branch in the middle is the ramus intermedius, and again, that occurs in about a third of patients. Now, moving further onto the branches on the left side of the coronary system, the LAD has branches called diagonal branches, and those are just abbreviated D1, D2, etc. And there's also septal perforators, which come off of the LAD and go vertically straight down into supply the interventricular septum. These branches supply about the anterior two-thirds of the interventricular septum. The left circumflex has branches called obtuse marginals, and again, these are just numbered OM1, OM2, etc. Now here are some static images showing the left main, which then bifurcates. You can see here, here's the LAD running in the anterior interventricular groove, a little bit of calcified plaque there and then the branch of that coming off and going to supply the lateral left ventricular wall is the diagonal branch and this happens to be the first diagonal branch in this picture. The left circumflex comes off and then the branch that's going to go off of that is the obtuse marginal branch. The obtuse marginal branch is going to go out towards the diagonal branch over the lateral left ventricular wall. Again, the diagonal and obtuse marginal branches are going to come together to supply that lateral left ventricular wall. One thing I want to point out is you can see the left circumflex continuing on here. And don't be surprised if you see a left circumflex, which is actually smaller in size than the obtuse marginal branch that's continuing on. Anything that comes out of the left atrioventricular groove is an obtuse marginal branch. And any vessel that stays in that groove is going to be the actual circumflex proper. Here we can see this patient actually is one of those one in three patients that has a ramus intermedius branch. You can see that it's coming out of the middle. So rather than being a bifurcation, it's a trifurcation. And this ramus intermedius branch is going to run out over the lateral left ventricular wall. So diagonal branch, obtuse marginal branch, or ramus intermedius are all going to supply the lateral left ventricular wall. Now let's move to the right coronary system. So on the right coronary system, the vessel runs in the right atrioventricular groove. The first branch that you're typically going to see is the conus branch, and that's going to supply the right ventricular outflow tract. Of note, about 50% of the time, this actually arises directly from the aorta rather than from the right coronary artery. Then you're going to see the sinoatrial nodal branch or the SA nodal branch. And that actually arises from the right coronary artery about 60% of the time. About 40% of the time, it's actually going to arise from the left circumflex. And actually, in reality, there's a few percentage that actually comes from both. So in reality, the numbers are more like 58%, 38%, and like 4% actually are supplied by both the right coronary artery and the circumflex. And then there's the acute marginal, which is going to supply the right ventricular free wall. Here you can see the nice big right coronary artery. In most patients, the right coronary artery is the dominant vessel, and that's going to run in the right atrioventricular groove. Here you can see the small branch, the conus branch, which is running up towards the right ventricular outflow tract. And actually, you'll notice in this case, the right coronary artery is here, and this branch is actually coming directly off of the aorta. Then here is the SA nodal branch coming off of the right coronary artery and traversing back to the SA node. And here's the acute marginal branch, which is coming off the right coronary artery to supply that right ventricular free wall. Now, there are some branch vessels, depending on the dominance, 
that can arise from either the right or left coronary artery system. The posterior descending artery, the PDA, which lives in the posterior interventricular groove, can actually arise from the right or the left. The AV nodal branch, you can see here, most of the time it arises from the right coronary artery, almost 90% of the time and only about 10% of the time it comes from the circumflex. And that's a vessel we don't see very often. It generally comes off the right coronary artery very low at the cruise of the heart and goes directly up into the AV node and it's very difficult to see it oftentimes. And then the posterior left ventricular branch or the PLV branch and that's going to supply the inferior basal aspect of the left ventricle and again that kind of is determined by the dominance or it actually can be off the left side if it's codominant. Here you can see a patient who's right dominant so in this case the posterior left ventricular branch or the posterior lateral branch is being supplied from the right coronary artery as well as the PDA. So that's a right dominant system and 70 to 80 percent of patients are actually right dominant. Now let's look at the normal coronary anatomy here on a full axial stack. So you can see here we've got the right coronary artery, we've got an SA nodal branch coming back to the SA node, we go up just a little bit here's our conus branch you can see it's a very small branch one thing I will warn you about um, if you see a conus branch that's say three to four times this size you want to be sure to follow it because I have seen some cases where there's a communication between the conus branch and the pulmonary outflow tract actually with the pulmonary artery as a fistulous connection. So it should be a small vessel. If you see it bigger, make sure you follow it up to make sure there's not a communication there. As we scroll on down, you can see there's a branch vessel coming off here. That's our acute marginal branch. And as we scroll on down even further, we've got this branch that's going to come over here. That's a posterior left ventricular, a posterior lateral branch. And then we've got our branch that's coming off underneath in the posterior interventricular groove, which is our PDA. If we go back up, we should see our main vessel coming off on the left side. That's our left main. It's going to bifurcate into our LAD and our circumflex. Remember, the LAD is going to run in the anterior interventricular groove, and the circumflex is going to run in the left atrioventricular groove. You can see that there are some branch vessels coming off here going towards the lateral left ventricular wall, rising from the LAD. Those are our diagonal branches. And any branch that's going to go straight down, you can see there's some small vessels here going straight down. Those are going to be our septal perforators. And then we've got a branch coming off here, again going out over the lateral left ventricular wall. And the vessel that continues on, that's going to be our circumflex. And this vessel that came out over the lateral left ventricular wall, that's going to be our obtuse marginal branch. And here's just a volume rendered image of it, again showing our left main. We've got the LAD here with diagonal branches. We've got the circumflex going on here with obtuse marginal, a large obtuse marginal branch here. And again, remember, it's not uncommon to see an obtuse marginal branch that's bigger than the circumflex. This one's slightly bigger, but oftentimes you can see ones that are significantly bigger. And then when we come over here, obviously our sinoatrial nodal branch and conus branch are very small, so they don't show up. But here's our right coronary artery running in the right atrioventricular groove. This is probably a little bit of the acute marginal branch showing up. And then we've got our posterior descending artery here. The posterior left ventricular or posterior lateral branch is not showing up. It's probably been removed in the process of making this image. So now let's talk about coronary anomalies. So there's basically three categories. We have the category of an abnormal origin. The origin can be okay with an abnormal course. And then we can have abnormal termination. So anomalies of origin, we can have vessels that come off too high. So generally what happens in this situation is rather than the vessels coming off of the coronary sinus or the sinuses of Valsalva, they actually come off of the tubular portion of the aorta above the sinotubular junction. They can have multiple ostea. In fact, the most common one of these would be no left main. So in this situation, you would have the LAD and the circumflex arising from the sinuses of Valsalva without a left main coronary artery. And that actually occurs in about 35% of cases of multiple ostea. 
You can also have a single coronary artery, which occurs in about 9% of patients. And you can also have them arise from the pulmonary artery. And then, of course, the one that most people talk about is when they arise from the opposite or non-coronary sinus and then have an anomalous course. And about 20% of these are the left coronary artery arising from the right side, and about 20% of these are right coronary arteries arising from the left side. So here we have an axial stack demonstrating multiple ostea. You can see that we have the LAD here and the circumflex coming off here, and there really is no left main. I'll scroll back and forth through that for you. And you can see there really is no left main. They're both coming directly off with their own separate ostea from the left coronary sinus. And here is the volume rendered image of that, again showing the LAD here, circumflex here, with no left main coronary artery. So here's a coronary with a single ostium. So you can see there's an ostium here, which is coming off the right coronary sinus. You can see that the right coronary artery is going this way. Again, we talked about it living in the right atrioventricular groove, so we know that's the right coronary artery. And then we've got a vessel coming this way. It actually is going through the interventricular septum to come out on the other side. So this is the left coronary artery arising from the right coronary artery and traversing to the other side via transeptal course. So we'll talk about the transeptal courses in just a second. But in this situation, there was only one coronary ostium. Now we have a case of a left coronary artery arising from the pulmonary artery. So you can see here's the pulmonary artery and we see this vessel arising here. And that's actually our left coronary artery. There was no left coronary artery down here. Now of course in this situation the blood flow is actually reversed. This is a high pressure to low pressure system. So the blood flow actually comes from the coronary artery back into the pulmonary artery, and that's why we get coronary steel. Here's just the opposite. So this is fairly unusual. I've only seen this one case, which is courtesy of Prachi Agarwal from Michigan. And in this situation, you can see that there's extensive collaterals. Many of these collaterals are actually bronchial arteries, but the others are these big dilated, you can see here, big dilated coronary artery. The left main coronary artery is very dilated. This was a patient who was fa fairly elderly, around 70 years of age. And you can see here, the right coronary artery was joining up with the pulmonary artery. There was no right coronary artery when you scroll down through that attaches to the aorta. Again, blood is going to flow through the coronary artery in a retrograde fashion in the right coronary artery to join the pulmonary artery. So again, we're going to have coronary steel, and the patient had lived so long and compensated. That's why we have these huge dilated collaterals. So when we talk about origin and course, we've got basically four main examples that we can talk about, especially with respect to course. So we can have vessels that go intra-arterial between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. And the ones that we get the most concerned about nowadays are when the left coronary artery traverses between these. The right coronary artery going between the pulmonary artery and the aorta now is considered to be generally managed medically. The vessel can actually traverse posterior to the aorta or in a retroaortic course. It can go in front of the pulmonary artery, which is a prepulmonic course. Or it can go, as we already saw in that one previous case, it can go transeptal. And that's this is an illustration that's trying to represent transeptal. I have seen one other type reported, which is a retrocardiac where it goes posterior to the atria. But I've not actually seen a real live case of that. Here's an example from the literature just to get us started showing the left coronary artery arising from the right side and going in front of the pulmonary artery. So this would be a pre-pulmonic course with an anomalous origin from the right side. So now let's look at some cases. This is a case where the right coronary artery is arising from the left cusp. You can see it's arising here, just on this side of the division here. So this is the left cusp here, and this is the right cusp and this vessel arises just barely on the left side there. And then you can see it's going between the pulmonary artery and the aorta 
to traverse in the right atrioventricular groove. So this is the right coronary artery with an anomalous origin from the left coronary cusp and an interarterial course. There's been much discussion about these being malignant, but the majority of the feelings nowadays are that generally these can be managed medically. Here's one with a retro aortic course. So you can see there's a vessel arising from the right coronary artery here, and as we follow it, it'll go retro aortic. So you can see it's going behind the aorta there to come over and live in the left atrioventricular groove. So we know from this one that that's just the circumflex, and sure enough, here's the LAD arising directly from the aorta and going in its normal course. So this is a circumflex that has a right-sided origin with a retroaortic course. Here's another circumflex with a retroaortic course, again rising from the right coronary artery here and going posterior to the aorta, coming down underneath the coronary sinus there to the other side and then you can see as we followed, it goes to the left atrioventricular groove. Again, the LAD is arising directly from the aorta. In this case, it was a little bit interesting because I think you can see here that the aortic root is dilated. This was a patient who was having aortic surgery, the ascending aorta repaired, for Marfan's. And this study was done just as a screening for the coronaries prior to the aortic surgery. And it was interesting that we found the coronary anomaly truly as an incidental finding. But it's very important because you can see this coronary is in close proximity to those coronary sinuses of that dilated aorta where they were going to be working. So it was very important for them to know about that coronary anomaly. Here's a case of transeptal. Uh, this is a different case than, we sh than I showed you earlier. But again, it's a case with a single ostium. You can see that the only ostium is here. The right coronary artery is going to go off this way to live in the right atrioventricular groove. And then the left coronary is actually coming here and traversing through, living within the interventricular septum, living within the my myocardium, and then going off. So this is a transeptal course with an origin of the left coronary artery from the right side. And most of the reports suggest that the transeptal course is not as big of a problem as a interarterial course even when it deals with the left coronary artery. Here's another transeptal course. The more we start looking for these, we, the more we've found actually over time. So again, right coronary artery going off this way. Here you can see the left coming off here and going in a transeptal course. Now the one thing that's a little bit different about this one is, is there actually is a left-sided coronary artery as well. So the left-sided coronary artery here appears to be the circumflex, which in this case appears to be relatively dominant. The right coronary artery appears to be relatively small and does not appear to make it all the way to the cruise of the heart. And so this was an LAD that was coming off with a transeptal course with the circumflex arising directly from the aorta. Here's a congenital heart case, which is kind of interesting when you start looking at the configuration of the coronary arteries. Here, this is the right atrioventricular groove, so we know that's the right coronary artery. And if we follow that back up, we see that that comes off over here, which is the left coronary cusp. So this right coronary artery is arising from the left coronary cusp and then traversing in its normal location once it gets to the right side of the heart. Now, there's another vessel here coming off the left coronary cusp, and let's see where that goes. That's going to go basically in the anterior interventricular groove with some branches coming out over the lateral left ventricular wall. So that's our LAD. So now we need to find our circumflex. So we go to where we know our circumflex lives. Here's our circumflex. Here's a obtuse marginal. Again, anything coming out of the groove and supplying that lateral left ventricular wall is obtuse marginal. And if we follow this vessel back, we can see this vessel is going behind the aorta. So you might think it's a retroaortic course. But look, it actually joins here. And the cusp that points to the interatrial septum is the non-coronary cusp in general. So this person actually has a circumflex coming off the non-coronary cusp. 
and then the right coronary artery and LAD actually coming off the left sinus of Valsalva or coronary cusp. Here's a little bit of a combination. Again, we're looking at a high takeoff. So this coronary artery comes off very high. You can see here the sinotubular junction is about here. And you can see that this vessel is coming off very high off the tubular portion of the aorta. In addition to that, it's traversing between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. Now, the good thing is, is that this is the right coronary artery, which we know in general is not as big of a deal as the left coronary when it goes intra-arterial. Here's another case with a high takeoff and an intra-arterial course, but in addition to that, there is a coronary artery arising from the pulmonary artery. So we've got our vessel here, which is coming off high off the tubular portion. You can see it's between the aorta and the pulmonary artery traversing over here, so it's living in the right atrioventricular groove. So that's our right coronary artery that's coming off high and going intraarterial. And then you can see we have another vessel here which is coming up and dumping into the pulmonary artery. Again, there's reversal of flow when we've got a anomalous coronary to the pulmonary artery. And you can see that's actually the entire left coronary arterial system. Here's our circumflex. And here's our LAD. They're both coming together and dumping into the pulmonary artery. So we've got kind of two anomalies in this case. Now, there can also be additional anomalies, of course. There can be myocardial bridging, and there can be duplicated vessels. In general, these are of little to no clinical significance. The main vessel you may see duplicated would be an LAD. I don't actually have an example of that. But I do have an example of a myocardial bridge. So the majority of the time, the coronary arteries live up here in the epicardial fat, but periodically they can traverse through the myocardium. You can see here there's myocardium above and below. Here you can see it's completely surrounded. Generally, they're fairly short like this one and don't cause any significance. Every once in a while, for example, I had one young patient that had reproducible pain and actually had a long 8 to 9 centimeter uh, myocardial bridge, a very deep LAD bridge. And that potentially was the cause of his symptoms. But most of the time, we see them in about a third of patients, and they generally don't cause any problems. There can also be anomalies of termination. The most common would be fistula, which occurs in about 13% of patients. There can also be what's called arcades. So that's, this is a direct communication between the two arterial systems, between the left and right coronary arterial system by these relatively straight vessels, so they're not tortuous vessels like you would expect to see with collaterals. And then there can also be termination extracardiac. Here you can see that there's a coronary artery to coronary sinus fistula. So we've got this large, very dilated right coronary artery. It's very tortuous because it's got a lot of flow, comes down. And then you can see that there's this sharp increase contrast which is within the coronary sinus and it's not just a single communication if you follow this and really analyze this there are kind of multiple fenestrated connections here between the coronary artery and the coronary sinus here you can see a fistula between the coronary artery and a cardiac chamber very large dilated coronary here coming off the left side this is actually the circumflex. You can see the LAD is coming off here. The circumflex comes down. It's this very large, tortuous vessel here. And if you follow it back, you can see that it actually then communicates through a fairly small communication here, right here, with the right atrium. And this just kind of shows you the same thing. You can see there's this big dilated vessel here. And then when we follow that, it communicates with the right coronary artery. Here's just a other example. So we've got a patient here who has the right coronary artery here. You can see that this branch here, which we would think would be the conus branch, is a little bit bigger than what we think it should be, but not too huge. So, and if we follow that, it actually keeps going past the RVOT. Actually, is going to come all the way over and actually becomes the LAD here. 
So in this situation, we actually have a vessel here, which we would call LAD. And then another, it becomes basically the diagonal branch and then the more distal portion of the interventricular septum is supplied by this vessel coming across. So in this situation, you could kind of call it a duplicate LAD, although they're not running side by side and supplying the same area. The proximal part of the septum is supplied by the LAD coming off the left main, and then the more distal part of the septum is actually supplied by this vessel that we would call LAD coming off essentially the conus branch of the right coronary artery. Here's another case. Looking at this case, we can see that there's a weird configuration of the circumflex. We've got the left coronary artery system coming off here. We would expect to see that bifurcate into the LAD and the circumflex, and we actually don't see the circumflex coming off anywhere there. So as we come down here, you can see there's a branch off here, and then that branch actually gives rise to this branch that's coming all the way back over here to supply the left atrioventricular groove to essentially provide the left circumflex. So it depends on how you want to nomenclature this. You know, is this a diagonal branch that then is giving rise, you know, that's supplying here. So is this a diagonal branch that's giving rise to the circumflex? Or would you call this a really long left main with a branch coming off here from to form the circumflex. I think this is more likely the circumflex actually arising from the diagonal branch and there really isn't a circumflex coming off of the left main itself. So now let's talk a little bit about the clinical importance and we want to talk a little bit about the ones that are hemodynamically significant. So coronary anomalies occur in about a third to one percent of patients in healthy patients. And hemodynamically, they're significant about 20% of the time. And the significance can be myocardial ischemia or sudden death. They can be arrhythmias or syncope. And in fact, about a third of non-traumatic sudden deaths in young adults are actually due to coronary anomalies, hemodynamically significant coronary anomalies. Conventional angio correctly identifies about half of the abnormalities compared to 16 slice CT. So this just emphasizes that even for a long time since the world of 16 slice CT, CT really is the gold standard for coronary anomalies. What ones are hemodynamically significant? Well, if the left or right coronary artery arise from the pulmonary artery, we've already talked about that and how the flow is reversed back into the pulmonary artery so that you have coronary steel. If it's an interarterial course, and again, that's primarily if the left coronary system goes interarterial. If there's a coronary artery fistula, that's also hemodynamically significant. And if there's a myocardial bridge, very rarely that will actually be hemodynamically significant, like the case I described to you a little bit earlier with the very long, eight centimeter long myocardial bridge. So when the coronary artery rises from the pulmonary artery, why is it a problem and what are some of the features? Well, generally these patients will have congestive heart failure and or ischemia within about four months of birth. So they're generally found very young. So that case I showed you, especially of the right coronary artery abnormality in that 70 year old is very rare. About 15 to 25% of the patients who have the anomalous left coronary artery arising from the pulmonary artery survive to adolescence or adulthood because of these collaterals before they're discovered. And the clinical course is more favorable, obviously, if you have more collateral vessels. The interarterial course, if the left coronary artery goes in an interarterial course, about 30% of those can have sudden death, and especially the young athletes, especially just after exercise. There are three mechanisms essentially proposed for why this is a problem. One is, is that there's an acute angle at the origin. And if you notice, if you go back and think about those cases, there was a very sharp angle at the origin of those anomalous interarterial coarse vessels, and that can cause decreased flow within the vessel. There can be compression because ge generally the coronary artery travels further within the actual wall of the aorta before it comes out. And again, that can limit flow. And finally, the compression between the pulmonary artery and the aorta. This really becomes significant with exercise as 
With exercise, you get more blood flow, and so the pulmonary artery and the aorta get bigger, so that's going to squeeze the vessel. And in addition, if you remember, the flow to the coronary arteries to the myocardium is during diastole, and so as you exercise, proportionally diastole changes, whereas systole does not change that much, so you get less time for blood flow, plus you're squeezing this vessel. Fistulas, about half are asymptomatic. When they are symptomatic, they can have congestive heart failure, endocarditis, or ischemia. About a half of fistulas occur from the right coronary artery, and then the rest are spread out over multiple other vessels. And you can see that when you have a fistula, about 40% of them, or the majority of them, are actually to the right ventricle versus the right atrium, pulmonary artery, or left ventricle. And then there's generally a left to right shunt in greater than 90% of these patients. So again, just going back to our learning objectives, hopefully we've quickly gone over the normal coronary artery anatomy so that you're comfortable with identifying normal coronary arteries. You can list three categories of anomalies. Again, origin, course, and termination. And then think about three of the hemodynamically significant anomalies such as the pulmonary artery origin, the fistulous communication, etc. Thank you very much for your attention.